Hi, Jared. Hey, John. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Nice to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you as well. <laughs> and, I, and thank you, everyone who's tuning in uh, live. If you have any questions for Jared, feel free to leave them in the question box, and we'll get, go through them as we, as we go on. And first, uh, for everyone tuning in, just a, a little introduction about Jared here. Uh, so Jared Spector was uh, most recently uh, on Broadway as Sonny Bono in The Cher Show. And he also originated the role of Barry Mann in Beautiful, the Carol King musical. And Shoot. he played the role in the pre-Broadway tryout here in San Francisco as well. And uh, Jared played Frankie Valli in Jersey Boys for a record 1,500 performances, including a year here in San Francisco on the uh, second national tour. And he was most recently here in San Francisco at the Golden Gate Theater, uh, in Roman Holiday, the musical in 2017. Right. <laughs> and right. uh, and tuning in can now watch him uh, as uh, George Murderer in The Killer Party, a murder <laughs> mystery musical, which is now available for purchase. Um, uh, KillerPartyMusical.com forward slash Broadway hyphen SF. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> it's my pleasure. It's so funny to hear you say George Murderer so casually. It's just a normal <laughs> character name, no problem. <laughs> right. um, so, so for, how, how have you been uh, for these couple of months during the during the pandemic? How has how has everything been with you? You know, um, I guess kind of like everyone else, it's uh, it's hard. It's hard to be part of an industry that is completely shut down mm -hmm. um, and sort of shut down indefinitely now. Forgive me, my dog is is here, so you might oh. hear some noises that have nothing to do with me. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, it's hard to be, it's hard to be part of an industry that's completely shut down. And, and uh, you know, even though certain shows say they may open or may not open at some point in, in 2021, it's like, you know, reality is who knows. <laughs> and uh, so that's, you know, that, that's, that's, that's tough. But my wife, Kelly and I have, um, we've tried to make, you know, the lemonade out of the lemons. I mean, as much as possible and taken time to concentrate on things that maybe we otherwise wouldn't have time to and study things we haven't uh, necessarily given ourselves uh, the windows in, in our lives to do. So uh, we, we got to spend some time with friends, uh, which is sort of odd, but also tied into uh, tied into uh, a killer party because we mm -hmm. actually stayed with uh, Laura Osnes and her, her husband, Nate Johnson, uh, at their lake house for the first, we were, we were happened to be there uh, for a weekend which turned into 108 days. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we actually got to spend time with friends for, for a lot of this um, and make great food and have play games and have fun for a while. So, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, we felt um, incredibly fortunate. And, and now we're back in New York and it's, you know, sort of mm -hmm. getting back to normal and understanding, you know, sort of this new reality, which again, everyone, uh, I just feel like when it started, we were like, well, this will only last but so long. And now really, who knows? Right, it was like, see, see everyone in a couple of weeks and here we yeah. are six months later. <laughs> right, I mean, I think that original shutdown for Broadway, you know, in early March was supposed to be for like four weeks or say, whatever it was. I mean, it was, you know, it was, of course we all knew that wasn't gonna last, but I mean, man, uh, yeah, it's, it's right. crazy. And that's something that, that is, uh, that's so great about A Killer Party is that we, people at home are able to, to watch their favorite Broadway actors do, do, do what they do best in, in, a, in a new format and something new. And, it, and I'm sure it was really great for you to be able to, to work with so many of your peers and to work with Laura Austin and just be creative during the pandemic and, and just like finding a way to, to, to use your skills and to, to bring joy to people who are just at home. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, when, so the, the, one of the, like the major creative force behind it, Jason Howland, um, who was the composer and also sort of can, can, you know, helped to come up with the concept in the first place called, and he called Laura and I, and he just kind of described this, like, you know, it was like, I think we're going to try to do this thing, you know, everyone will be at home, you know, so, you know, it's like, so it'll take advantage of like the concept of it'll take advantage of people being in various places. Cause it'll be like a musical version of clue or knives out where like everyone's in one house and they're interviewed so it makes sense that you're alone in one room and all this and we're like all right and he's like yeah i'll take a day or two and then it turned into this like massive thing which is great you know and it's <laughs> it's really exciting and 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 fun and you know i again every time i talk about this i uh i give the utmost kudos to the editors because they had to take you know 12 different setups of talking about sound and and lighting and you know various uh, instruments like camera instruments and try to make it into one cohesive sort of homogeneous piece and i don't know how they did it it's it's pretty unbelievable frankly um sound sound and uh, both sound and the audio and the video video is is incredible but yeah i mean it was um 
it was a relief and also <laughs> a little bit of like, oh, right, this is the thing that we do when we were asked to do it. And suddenly it, it had been months since we had done much other than, you know, play, you know, play some instruments around the house occasionally. Mm -hmm. Just suddenly be like, okay, we're going to go into a studio or like a little home studio and pre-record these things and then sing them and act and film and, you know, and then suddenly do all the things that now actors have to do, which is uh, way beyond our normal creative process, which has become uh, amateur lighting designers and sound designers and cinematographers and editors. And it's, it's, it's all pretty crazy. But, you know, I mean, it's again, it's like sort of learning on the fly. And this is, uh, this is, this is the reality now. But yeah, it was nice to be able to, you know, even virtually, even to have Zoom meetings with uh, directors and other actors and talk through things and uh, and feel, you know, some semblance of normal, you know, if, if even for just a day or two here and there. Sure, yeah. And for, could you tell uh, people watching who, who haven't had a chance yet to see A Killer Party, a murder mystery musical, what, it, what it's all about? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, listen, it's... Um, it's super kitschy and fun and, and the music is great, but the, but the basic vibe is that uh, there is a theater company uh, on Lake Superior and uh, the, the, uh, the artistic director writes a murder mystery musical and invites all of his normal cast members who also do other things in their life because they can't make their money just doing dinner theater. Uh, they invite him to it. They, he invites them all over to, their to the house to introduce them to this new show that they're all gonna put on. And then there is a murder that takes place. And then of course a detective is called in and then everyone is quarantined to their own separate rooms so they can be interrogated one at a time. And that's sort of the general vibe. And then of course, from there you get uh, uh, an idea of, you know, who did it who is, you know, of course all the intrigue of a, of a normal murder mystery, but as, you know, as slapstick and goofy as, as you could possibly want it to be. And also with lots of elements of the actual show within the show, um, some of our cast members, uh, or like the, some of the characters, like Alex Newell plays a, a character who is very much into the story and is using elements of the musical within the musical to try to figure out the, the mystery. And it's, it's really funny and goofy and, and a, an 80 minute escape from, you know, COVID-19. Right, exactly. I, I, yeah. I watched um, all, all the episodes as they came out weekly, and then I, I watched them all again yesterday, and I just had so much fun. It was, yeah, it's, it's a blast. And yeah, and you, you mentioned um, Alex Newell, and you have a bunch of other great, talented cast members as well. Michael James Scott, Jackie Burns, Miguel Cervantes, Laura Osses, Carolee Carmelo, um, Jessica Keenan Wynn, Drew Galing, Jeremy Jordan, Christina Alibato, and yourself. It is just so much fun. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, well, what, a, what a great cast. Have you, have you worked with, um, oh, I know that, that you've worked with, uh, with Drew, uh, Drew Galing in, in Jersey Boys and in Roman Holiday. Um, mm -hmm. Have you worked with any of the other um, cast members before? Um, I worked with, uh, so I did Beautiful with Jessica Keenan Wynn. Mm -hmm. um, she was the first replacement for Anika Larson um, on Broadway when uh, I think Anika took her, her leave because she was, she was pregnant and, uh, and Jessica came in. Um, so I'm very, I'm very close with Jessica. You know, it was, it was fun. I mean, again, like the only person I got to work in the same room was, was Laura. Um, but because we happened to be quarantined in the same home at the same time. And Laura, I had done, uh, I had done some workshops and concerts with before, uh, and Jessica, but no, I think the rest, I think everyone else, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to like run through everyone off the top of my head. Of course, I've, I've met everybody and I've spent time with them, but other than, yeah, but of course, Drew is one of my closest friends, but as, as you mentioned, this is we. We've been buds now since uh, 2007. So when we when we met doing uh, Jersey Boys in San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, but the rest of them I've, I've of course you know friendly with or had contact with, but never actually worked with. So uh, it's fun to I mean, again even just virtually to you know to be on the, to share the screen with. Right, and what was um, what was the rehearsal process like? I know that uh, Mark Bruni, who directed you in Beautiful as well as Roman Holiday, he directed A Killer Party. And so, yeah, so did you have the Zoom, Zoom meetings? Was a lot of, was it like FaceTime involved? How, how, how is it like putting together um, this piece where you have all the actors in all, you know, 12 different locations and what, what was that process like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, again, totally new reality. I mean, normally if you, you know, especially theater, but forgetting even theater, even just film and television, you, you know, you, you're on set with people who are telling you where to stand and there's somebody lighting it and you know there's someone shooting it and and here we because because it was impractical to have our creative team zooming with us 24 hours a day i mean because everyone was sort of on their own and filming in their own time mm -hmm. um so you've got people all across the country in various time zones filming their pieces in their own homes at various times so it was impractical for them to be sort of on call for us 
all the time. So we'd have Zoom meetings and just prep as best we could. Um, and, and then, you know, we all sort of trusted one another that, okay, we're, you know, b given these parameters, I think we're going to put the camera here. I think we're going to do this. You know, it was just everything ahead of time to be like, okay, you know, this scene, we're not exactly sure, but especially, especially you, you've got some group scenes with nine people who aren't in the same place. So how could right. you possibly do that? It's kind of a fascinating process. So, you know, they were really smart. Um, they gave us prep and they were like, okay, so go through this scene, say every line in multiple directions, multiple takes. So, you know, you would do every single line nine different times, you know, a couple ways this way, a couple ways this way. So depending on who they wanted, because not every line was necessarily directed at the same person that it was, you know, originally in the script, or if it were, you know, it might, you know, it might just be that person might have in their minds actually moved across the room. And now you're talking to, so it's like everything ahead of time, do like cover as much coverage as is humanly possible. So that when the editors had this, mon again, monumental task of putting it together, uh, they had everything that they could possibly need to work with. E that said, I'm sure that there were some missed things were like, oh God, I wish they could have gone back and done X, Y, or Z. But, you know, I think fortunately for the most part, as I watched it, you know, you have a lot of talented actors who were able to cobble together performances, even though they were most of the time talking to no one at all. Um, and we had some, you know, some very technical uh, direction, like, Everyone who was talking to Jessica Keenan and Wynn, who you'll find out very quickly, I'm not spoiling anything, is the detective in this case. She she looks at one side of the camera, so everyone who's talking to her look at the other side of the camera. It's like sort of basic thing so that it looks like you're talking to each other. And then sometimes you really, you know, again, the editors did such a good job. You can get caught up in, you know, the suspension of disbelief. And yeah, they're, they're in the same bathroom, for sure. For sure they're in the same, you know, I mean, it's, uh, so it was just a lot of, a lot more advanced prep and storyboarding and uh, and planning so that when the time actually came to do it and they had to put it together, you know, because there was no, there, there weren't, there just wasn't a lot of time for reshoots and mm -hmm. there's just no way for even Mark, you know, I mean, everyone was, you know, was thinking ahead as best they could and planning so well, but, you know, it's impossible for Bruni to anticipate every single thing that could or could not go wrong, you know, it's, uh, it was, it was a, it was a wild, it was, it was a wild process. Great, we have, we have a question um, from a fan, from a fan, um, from M. Glickman. Uh, and, and they ask, uh, did you shoot your own scenes for A Killer Party? Did you have help with the team? And how many different takes did an average scene take? Oh, good questions. Um, so everyone did it on their own for the mm -hmm. most part. I mean, some people, I know like some people have spouses or partners or people they were living with who could help them. Um, I know like Michael James Scott has a very talented person living with him. So that's kind of not fair. But no, but that's why his stuff looks so great. And it's in the first, especially in the first episode. So kicks us off uh, and, and sets the bar impossibly high for everyone else. Um, but uh, like Laura and I did our scenes at home. We, you know, we filmed one another. Uh, my wife Kelly filmed me and some of my stuff. We got, um, Laura's, hus Laura's husband is a professional photographer. So mm -hmm. of course he was extremely helpful in, in filming some of our stuff, especially when we had to do scenes together and we couldn't possibly hold the camera for one another. Um, we tried to limit the number of takes. I mean, you know, again, because we're really not sure exactly what we're shooting for. So we felt like doing a million takes, like, you know, we'll give them as many options as we, but because we're not, we're not exactly sure we're aiming at. We're like, you know, we'll give them as many takes as we think makes sense with as many different styles and interpretations of characters and the character in this moment as we possibly could. But I would say anywhere from, you know, three or four takes to, you know, to eight or nine, depending on, depending on the scene. Uh, so, you know, it took, it, it took a lot, a lot longer than it seems, you know, they seen each episode, I think is what, like somewhere between eight, eight and 10 minutes or 12 minutes or whatever it is. But each of them took quite a bit longer than that to shoot, which is totally normal, of course, when it comes to uh, film and television. Great. Well, thanks. And, and thanks M. Yeah. for that question. If anyone else has questions, feel free to leave them in the question box. Um, and yeah, so, so, so yeah, we talked a little bit about the, the filming. What was the recording like? I know that you mentioned that you set up like a little home studio. Um, what yeah. Was, what was that experience? So, um, yeah, I mean, normally, if you were going to do something like this, our music director, Jason Howland, has a professional home studio and he would say, come over Thursday at two and we'll sing through your tunes and then you'll sing, you know. But of course, that wasn't the case here. So I think everyone was doing the best they could. Some people already have sound equipment because, you know, I mean, Drew Galing, for instance, does a lot of voiceover stuff. So I think he had some equipment. Um, Laura and I, you know, got a microphone that we could hook up so that we could then so we had like three instruments going at the same time. We had one to, you know, to read the music and another to play the music into our ears and then another one to actually sing into. Um, so we're, you know, we're, you know, doing multiple takes of that. And then we sent everything to Jason once it was all done. And Jason would then mix it, uh, you know, at least a rough mix, send it back to us so that we could 
sing along to the track while we recorded, especially the musical scenes. Mm-hmm. So anything musical is obviously pre-recorded. We, you know, we were singing along live, but you know, ultimately what you hear is is tracked. Mm-hmm. So then we would do that, and then of course send him, and then all the dialogue was picked up live, and then we'd send everything again back to them, <laughs> and then they would try to mix everything and make things again sound like they were of a piece, even though. Everyone was recording the different instruments. Our some stuff was pre-recorded. Other stuff was being picked up live from across the room, especially if it was, you know, uh, you know, because we had our iPad set up or we were using cameras, but like picking up the sound with a microphone, like a space microphone. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it was it was it was pretty nutty. It was pretty right, nutty. Yeah. Something I loved, uh, which was at the very end of, of A Killer Party, and this is no spoilers, but but it's just um, at the very end, you, you see everyone behind the scenes just saying thank you for tuning in and thank you for watching. And, and you see just just how um, how, how large a group of people that worked on this was, and you get to see them like in their like home studios with the with the editing screens and everything. It looks like such a such a such a big undertaking with so many different people collaborating on it. Oh yeah, I mean it's a massive team if you consider. First of all, just the I mean the, so you have the number of actors and that's what you see on screen. Then you have um, all of the all of the writers and, the, and you know and, and then all of the musicians because Jason commissioned every you know I mean these are full live tracks that you know that all of these various musicians had to record in their home studio and then sent to Jason and then everything would have to be mixed and mastered so that it sounds good. And then, I mean, of course the editors, I, again, I can't even imagine. And then they had, we had all of these young singers uh, singing backup for, uh, which was again, like this is all stuff I didn't even know until I got to watch it. Oh, wow. uh, because yeah, because you know, all I do, I, I got my, I got the, the script of course, so I knew what was going on, but you know, Laura and I filmed our stuff and then we sent it in and you know, we wait and see what, what happens. Then you see <laughs> Alex Newell singing this, essentially like this huge production number with dozens and dozens of backup of, of co- like chorus members singing behind him, and it's just so cool. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it, it was great that that so yeah, so many different people were, were able to participate with with the with the big ensemble numbers, and and everyone gets their moment to to be on screen. It was really it was really wonderful, and to, to see especially young people be involved as well. That was that was really great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's nice to get everyone involved, and you know, I'm sure even for just a moment of time, again, all of those people get to just set themselves up and, and learn something, just even the process of learning a new song for the other than just to play it at home, like for actual purposes, like to learn and sing and get it out there. You know, I, I hope that everyone uh, had fun doing it. Right. And, um, um, and so, so you talked about um, uh, what just, just what, what is it meant to, to be able to, to collaborate with so many different creatives during, during this time? I know that you, yeah, just uh, what, what what was it like before you got the call, or what was that? What was just like how how just how exciting was it to be like okay, great, now I'm working on something here. I get to be creative again. Um, what did what did that mean to you? Well, honestly, at first it seemed like uh, you know a fairly low key project. Mm-hmm. That it, I mean, I I don't think that even the creative team who was writing and you know getting it ready understood um, what that they were sort of jumping into what was a vacuum. And so that this, I mean, I think part of why uh, A Killer Party has gained so much steam is because there's just not that much going on. I mean, I know everyone is sort of thirsty for content. My, you know, it's when I told my parents about it, like, I can't wait, when is coming out? You know, because everyone wants to, you know, there's just, I mean, the idea of being able to watch anything remotely related to theater and musical theater is just so kind of alien right now. Um, so it was great to get the call and be able to, you know, know that we're gonna work on just anything at all. And at first, again, we thought it was, pretty low key, it was going to be no big deal. And then as we started to work on it more and more, you're like, oh, this is actually pretty involved. And all of these things yeah. are, are a little bit uh, easier said than done. And, but, you know, again, like, you know, fun to just have challenges. Because before that, you know, we were mostly concentrating on, you know, what we were going to eat that night. I mean, I guess a coll- like a little collective family at this lake house, mm-hmm. we were kind of, just, you know, <laughs> concentrating on cooking and uh, and we were all doing our various things. My wife is writing a novel and I'm, I was studying, you know, game theory course, like whatever it does, you know, I mean, playing poker. Uh, and then suddenly we got this call and we actually had some real creative work to do. And you're like, right, this is, this is the thing that we do, right? So we're going to think about this now and learn a song. And it was, you know, it was fun to, to flex those muscles. And, uh, you know, we had th- thankfully we had a, I, we had brought a, an electric keyboard to the, to the house so we could rehearse and go over things and guitar, you know, it would be able to, to be able to rehearse everything. And, um, and then it was nice again just to revisit old old friends and and creative members. I mean, I've worked with Mark Bruni a number of times now on um, mm-hmm. on Beautiful, and of course, and and on um, another we did another show at, at Barrington Stages, and of course at Roman Holiday, and Jason Helen as well. I've worked with a number of times. You know, it's great to be able to just to to work with friends and see them and have a reason to 
call Jessica Keenan went on the phone and be like, okay, when are you, all right, we're in this weird, she, there's a scene where I'm in a bathtub and she's talking to me and you're like, okay, when are you standing up? When are you sitting down? So I know even where to look. And you know, again, like all the things that you can't do in person because she's not there in the room. Right. It's for me to know when she's gonna squat so I can change my eye line and change the camera. But uh, so we had to sort of figure it all out ahead of time. But again, it, you know, nice to just be able to work on, on anything. Yeah. You know, and what, yeah. what was that? Uh, what was that time like? Uh, like, like, how, how long did you have um, to to work on this before it was um, before it was all put together? Um, well, several weeks. I mean, they they would give us the they gave us the script. We would get the first three episodes, and it was sort of you know this is your loose. Give us you know make sure try to try to get the songs recorded this week so that we can get them back to you, and then next week shoot them and then send them back to us because. We understood the lead time, especially for the editors, was going to be long. So they they sort of delivered everything to us three episodes at a time, kind of like they they did when they released the episodes to uh, to the to the public. And um, so yeah, so we sort of worked on it a few weeks at a time. I mean, I think the whole thing from beginning to end was something like six weeks, but uh, or maybe a little bit less. But again, it was really just you know it was sort of piece by piece. And then again, the whole thing grew. And then you're like, okay, you're actually going to be in episode seven, eight, and nine. And we we're like, oh, we thought we were only in episode one and six. Got it, no problem. And then of course, you know, we had more days of shooting and setups and, and all and all the things. It was, uh, <laughs> again, more than we thought it was going to be, but ultimately uh, really rewarding to be able to watch because it's, you know, it's so, it's so, it's, it seems so much more, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to say it's the wrong way. It looks so much more professional than it felt doing it because, you know, I'm not a cinematographer, you know, not, right. we, we don't know what we're doing. We, we have some idea, but again, like we're shooting it on iPads and, you know, this, you know, this little iPad microphone and we're doing the best that we can with some lights and, you know, and a setup in the basement on a ping pong table. And we, we really did the best that we could. We didn't think it would look and feel uh, as substantial and professional as it looks. And I think, again, that's just a testament to, uh, you know, to the editing team, they're, they were, they're, they're wizards. Great, yeah, and uh, it, it's so much fun to watch. And if you haven't seen it, if you're watching, um, you can find it at killermusical.com. Um, and it's, yeah, it's great. You can um, own it for, uh, excuse me, yeah, Killer Musical, Killer Party Musical .com. Killer Party Musical, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I know that, um, Yes, you've taught, you've, we've mentioned here that you were most recently in uh, San Francisco in 2017 uh, in Roman Holiday, the musical at the Gold Gate Theater uh, with yep. Drew Bailing. And right. yeah, what would you enjoy most about, about being here in San Francisco again, about being in that production? Uh, I, uh, I love, I mean, San Francisco is, you know, I mean, other than New outside of New York, I've spent most of my, you know, big chunks of my adult life in, in San Francisco and in Chicago. And I just, you know, they're two my two other favorite cities. I just, I just love San Francisco um, for, you know, the, the, the same obvious reasons that everyone loves the city. But yeah, I mean, just, it's a wonderful town. It's got, you know, it's got great energy. Um, it's got culture. It's got such respect and um, for, 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 you know, for the arts. Um, you know, I, it, the proximity to everything around San Francisco uh, is, 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 not to, is not to be scoffed at. I mean, it's just, a, it's a wonderful spot. And I, you know, I spent a full year there um, as a younger person uh, when I was in Jersey Boys. And, and, you know, when I first started in Jersey Boys, I only did the Frankie Valley two times a week. So the rest of the mm -hmm. week I had, you know, <laughs> quite a bit of free time to yeah. explore, uh, to, you know, to explore the city, which was, you know, which was wonderful. And then I took over the role full time after that. So, you know, the second half was a little busier, but um and then when I came into the show uh, and, and did uh, Roman Holiday, it was, you know, it was like going back and visiting an old friend. And it was great because I, uh, you know, I knew the city so much better. And, you know, my friend Drew and I were living together. We're like, all right, we'll live here. You know, we just, it's actually nice to be able to look at the, uh, to look at a map and, you know, go on Airbnb and be like, actually, I know, I actually know where they, I actually know that bar stop. We're going to, we're going to live right there. It's going to be easy to get to the Golden Gate. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I, I adore the city and uh, I miss it. You know, I miss, I miss, uh, and, and I, the, the, the theater crowd there is so, smart and involved and you know it's such a having done now a few um trial runs of shows there i mean roman holiday was intended to go to broadway and things happen and maybe it'll still end up going but having done beautiful and uh and roman holiday and of course jersey boys for the amount of time it's you know it's such a great place to try out a show because the 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 crowd is savvy and and uh, but also supportive you know it's it's kind of that wonderful mix of they're smart and they know what they and they know what's good um, but they're also incredibly positive and supportive. And it's, I, I got to tell you, for as short a run as, uh, as Roman Holiday had in San Francisco, it's shocking the number of people who come up to me to talk to me about Roman Holiday and how much they loved it. And it's just a testament to that. That means that people are traveling to San Francisco to see it. The crowd from San Francisco was traveling to New York to see shows here and then to, to hang out at the stage door and talk about Roman Holiday afterwards. And, um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, among many other things, the, uh, you know, the, the crowd and the culture around theater in San Francisco is, uh, is one of the things I love about the city. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah our, our fans loved Roman Holiday. It looked gorgeous. And the, the, the yeah. music was so much, it was so much fun. And yeah. Was, yeah really Hard fun. to go wrong with Cole Porter. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> and, and so, yes, yeah, so you've played, um, you played Frankie Valley and Jersey Boys and Barry Man and Beautiful and, and Sunny and the Share Show. And so, so you're playing these, um, these real life people on stage. And I'm just curious, what, uh, what's your artistic process like in bringing um, these, these real life people on stage and, and, and interpreting them in, in your own way? Sure. Um, you know, so the the very basics of script analysis don't change, right? Whether you're playing someone real or whether you're playing Hamlet or whatever it is, it's sort of all the same. But when it comes to portraying a real person um, and a real person who was extremely visible, I mean, it's one thing to play Galileo. It's another thing to play someone who for whom, you know, for whom people can find hundreds of hours of YouTube videos and, you know, people come and see it and they have a very visceral connection to their memories of Frankie Valley singing Sherry, they made out for the first time, you know, or whatever it is, you know, it's like they're, you know, people have these very specific memories. So, you know, there's obviously a different level of um, externals that have to be put on and that have to be authentic um, in order for the, the audience to suspend disbelief. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the, you know, that's, that's part of the job is to disappear behind this character while also being true to the author's intention in the script because everyone has their idea of what Frankie or, or especially, you know, Frankie and Sonny look like, sound like, et cetera, and what their, you know, their public personas were. But we're also telling uh, in both cases, a real life story um, about real people and people might not necessarily know every single detail of every single conversation and their actual real life human motivations and how they behave. So, you know, behind the scenes, behind the camera, not when, not Sonny and Share Comedy Hour Sonny, but real life Sonny, you know, arguing for something he really believes in. So, you know, it's, it's kind of that, that combination of those two things about honoring, you know, the author's intention and listening to your director and then also doing the thing that I know that, that we know we have to do when you're playing this real life person, which is to bring them to life in an as authentic uh, a way as possible and to honor uh, what makes them recognizable. So, you know, I mean, for in, in all these cases, sort of finding the pillars of their physical and uh, their physical presence, their, you know, their vocal presence and, um, and, uh, and bringing them to life in a way that's mm. both uh, authentic and sustainable. You know, I mean, mm. Sonny's voice is tricky and it's hard to do eight times a week, but you know, you sort of, you know, keep playing around with it until it's there. And then you're like, ah, oh, sure. And it, it, yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, so that's, that, that's, that's a big, those are big parts of it. And uh, finding the ways to do it over and over again and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and bring it. So Frankie, you know, Frankie's, it's the voice, it's his very specific posture, you know, it's the accent, but also the attitude. And so everything about Frankie's got, you know, has to have, and then Sonny's very different, you know, sort of crotch forward, leaning back. He's got last having California kind of a vibe and you know, you've got, so it's like you put all of, you do all of this work ahead of time, watch endless videos, you know, put them in your ear and sing and speak along with them until it's hard to tell the difference between your voice and that voice. <laughs> and then learn all the lines and put it on stage and hope that um, you can maintain all of those externals. You have to sort of keep them in your body until they're second nature so yeah. that you can also then act <laughs> and yeah. not, and not have to be in your head and self-conscious about every single thing that you're doing. That is just like all the external stuff is second nature and you can actually just, you know, play the scene. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for walking us walking us through that. Like, yeah, it makes sense yeah. that that, that it, it's such a layered performance that that you want to make sure that you have those foundations before, as you said, before you can actually act and 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 live that character. There are so many different things to make it relatable, as well as um, just have have the character read on stage and and have that vision of what an audience thinks that person is, but also the way that you you're finding your way into the character. It's, That's it. It sounds like it's such. Uh, such a, a complex um, experience. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I know you've hit the nail on the head. It is, it's riding that line between what I, what we all as the actor know the audience needs, mm -hmm. like not expect, but the, what an audience, any audience needs to believe that that person is Frankie Valley or that person is Carol King. Mm -hmm. And then also on, again, you know, playing the scenes authentically and organically mm -hmm. and being able to, you know, act and react. Um, you know, I mean, I, I've seen it done very well at, at, at times. I mean, I think the best couple of examples are for what you're talking about is um, like Jesse Mueller, who everyone in San Francisco saw play Carol King. And if you are on Broadway, you know, God bless you. Um, 
because it was such a masterful performance and exactly mm -hmm. what you're saying, which is that she brought her authentic version of Carol. She brought enough of, enough of Carol's essence to the stage that everyone was able to suspend disbelief and believe that she was Carol King, even though if you listen to their voices side by side, it's not an exact, it's not a copy. It's not an imitation. Mm -hmm. It's just, she found her way through Car through Carol's vulnerability and the way that Carol is very raw. You know, Jesse brought right. all of that. So that you're able to be like, that's her, that's Carol, even though, you know, it's not, again, it's not a mirror image and it wasn't supposed to be. It's supposed to be an authentic representation of this person's life on stage. Um, and I think the other best I've ever seen is my wife played uh, Liza Minnelli in the Fosse mm -hmm. Burden series. And, you know, mm -hmm. she was, you know, anyone who watched that was like, that's her. That's, that yeah. is her. That is, it, you know, she was unbelievable. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, that, those are the two, those are about the two best I've ever seen. Great. We, um, we have a comment from Jocelyn Merck 36. I'd love you and share a show. Um, and we actually have a, have a, um, a comment from, uh, this is from uh, Elise uh, Helgram. And speaking of the share show, what was your favorite, favorite bit from the share show? Man. <laughs> Well, what's fun about the share show, um, I mean, it's, first of all, there's so many bits, right? I mean, it's just every, because the show is sort of a variety show within a show. And the show, that, the version of the show that we did in Chicago was, again, very different from the show that we did on Broadway. And we had multiple versions because I was, I was in the share show from the very first, you know, staged reading um, in January 2017. So, like, I, I did every single version of that show. And it changed so much. Um, some of my favorite stuff ultimately got cut, which is, you know, that's what happens. They, you know, they cut your darlings. But I mean, I don't, I don't want this to sound cliche, but it, it's hard to not, you know, fall in love with that I Got You Babe sequence, um, especially because as the actor, you get to go from them having, you know, them being very shy and being on top of the pops, which is a real thing for the very first time on television in London. And for, you know, these two kind of shy, hippie looking, even though they never, they weren't actually hippies and they never did drugs, it's these two sort of hippie looking kids mm -hmm. singing this really sweet song that you know Sonny wrote and had Cher sing in the middle of the night uh brought her down you know to the piano at three in the morning and had her sing along and they sort of you know fell in love with this tune that he put together and you know watching them grow in over the course of that song from this sort of little top of the pops and them being very shy to being sort of the Sonny and Cher that we all know and yeah. love yeah. um with this you know big explosive worldwide hit uh, I think it was, a, you know, it's a really creative bit of staging, you know, it's the way that the music builds and the song is sort of, you know, this is so lovely and forever. Um, you know, that was, I guess, my, that was, I guess, my favorite part. And I, you know, and I got to, you know, work with uh, my girl, Michaela Diamond in it all, you know, every night. And we, uh, you know, we really bonded and, and became really close friends over the course of that show. So, you know, getting to share that moment with her on stage was always special. Oh, that's great. And Matt yeah. Perry, uh, 2712 says, the high note and I got you, babe, you're always around. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I'm not sure who came up with that idea, because that isn't how the original song was. Uh, that's not this. That's not the original distribution of lines in the original song. And um, you know, and no, no, no disrespect to Sonny at all, but I'm not sure that he had that note in his in his range. But um, yeah, we we all we first of all we raised the keys from the original, and then they just redistributed that lines to give me that you know to give me that big that big D natural. Um, which kept me on my toes every single day and made sure that I was always warming up my voice and eating properly and not drinking too much alcohol at night because every day I knew I had to get on stage and hold out this be natural. Uh, but, you know, again, always, always good to have a challenge in a show. <laughs> Good. We have another question here. This is from um, the dot share dot show said, uh, if you had to switch into a share show ensemble track, which would you do? I love uh, Michael Fadiga's, Fadiga's track. Oh, good question. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, gosh, you know, I mean, I, I always say that I'm not, um, I'm not talented enough to be in the ensemble of the share show. Not, not even close. That's not, that's not like blowing smoke that I am not talented enough to be in, in, in the ensemble of that show. But uh, yeah, I guess if I had to pick one, Michael Fadick, I did have some great character work that he got to do. Uh, you know, I mean, all the various accents and different people, and he actually got some like real scenes to do. Yeah, I think I think I would have to choose Michael's track. Yeah, I mean, he gets to play Phil Spector. I mean, yeah, he had so many so many goofy, funny lines and 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 great laughs. So yeah, that 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 that'd be the one. <laughs> great, and, and so you, you you talked about how you were uh, with the Share Show from the from the very beginning. I um, mean, I just wanted to ask you. Um, about your experience uh, in, in Beautiful, the Carol King musical, um, being in the pre-Broadway trial here in San Francisco and then bringing that show to Broadway. 
Um, and just what was what was that experience like for you? Well, that was the first show that I um, that I got to originate a role, um, you know, originate a you know a major role, and watch this show progress again from a reading to you know a fully fledged production in San Francisco, and sort of again getting attention that we didn't necessarily think it was going to get, or at least that I didn't know. I mean, I remember the first time we did the reading. The, look, the music was undeniable, but there are a lot of great scores, right? I mean, there are a lot of great, incredible American songbooks that we all know and love. It doesn't necessarily mean that this, that those great song, that those great pop songbooks translate to a show on stage that anyone's going to care about. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember being in there and, and, uh, and watching in, in the first reading and sitting there and watching people come, you know, come to Bernadette Peters was there and she was like in the oh, second wow. row, just hysterical crying. You're like, oh, huh. Like there's a thing, there's a connection there to this music that I at, at first didn't quite understand. Um, and it was, it was a, definitely an education for me to go through the process of being a part of that show and, and understanding how important Carol and, and, and Barry and Cynthia's music uh, is to not just, not just like to the musical world, but the, you know, to, to anyone who grew up in that time. Right. And, uh, you know, and how deep and impactful Carol's music and persona is um, to human beings and, and particularly to to women and any woman who wants to sit down with an instrument and sing. I mean, you know, I remember Sarah Bareilles at, at Open Dynamic. There's no Sarah Bareilles if there's no Carol King. And like, wow, that's, you know, that's a that's a pretty powerful statement. If you, you know, if you consider um, what an icon she is and, uh, you know, and, and how many other Sarah Bareilles there are. Is there an Adele without a Carol King? Like, you don't, you know, I mean, right. again, she she paved the way in such a in such a remarkable way. And it was such an education for me, uh, but both musically and culturally to be a part of that show. And to watch it grow from this little reading with Bernadette Peters crying to getting, you know, a uh, really a great reception in San Francisco. And again, uh, education for both the company and for the creative team. And then watching it, you know, blossom on Broadway into this, this big smash hit that I, I, again, I just, I'm not sure that anyone saw coming um, mm -hmm. because it was a, such a humble show. Uh, and, you know, again, like Jersey Boys is pretty flashy and, and beautiful was just humbler in, in, in its presentation. And, and, you know, and, and Carol is a humble person and you know but 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 again someone someone you can really root for and she's such a she's just such a winner and having met her and spent time with her she's you know she's everything you want her to be so again nobody deserves a story told and uh, and being and to be championed the way carol king does i think <laughs> oh that's really wonderful thank you for sharing yeah um and yeah speaking of um, of jersey boys so you you joined the second cast uh, the second second san francisco cast of jersey boys in 20, 2007 here in san francisco and mm -hmm. then you later played the role in chicago and on broadway and yeah, I'm just wondering if you have any fond memories of, you, of your year here in San Francisco with Jersey Boys. Oh, for sure. I mean, again, when I started out, it was the first national tour. Um, mm -hmm. So when the show opened there in, I want to say December 2006, mm -hmm. uh, I was there with, I was there. So I was playing Frankie twice a week then. Uh, it was, uh, again, so that, that process was nuts because, we, you know, there was another guy playing Frankie Valley and, and I was also playing Frankie, but I was the two, the two show a week. So I didn't get much in the mm -hmm. way of rehearsal repetitions. And then... I, I remember, you know, they were like, okay, we're going to do a put-in rehearsal for you tomorrow. And a put-in is basically the entire show, full out, full tech, full lights, full costumes, just no one in the audience. But for me, I mean, just sort of tossed on stage and like, okay, well, this is going to happen. And then a few <laughs> days later, I was on stage and it was just, it was all such a crazy mind bending blur. Uh, and I, I was able to do the show there. So twice a week for, the, you know, the first four months. And then I went back to New York to rehearse with the new cast, which was ultimately going to be the Chicago company, mm -hmm. came back to, you know, San Francisco for another five months before we, before we moved on to, uh, to Chicago. And then I think another, I think the second, like, I think the Vegas cast replaced us and then went to Vegas and then the, the second national tour cast came and I get, you know, a testament to what a great theater town San Francisco is that they embraced Jersey Boys uh, and supported it for, for so long. And it was, you know, such a, such a part of that show's success comes from its, its home base in San Francisco and the ability for each company to, you know, to start there and launch and, um, but memories, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just, I was only did the show twice a week. So I had had so many opportunities to eat everything. I mean, <laughs> Swan Oyster Depot and, you know, every, just every, I mean, I, I particularly love that place, but really every single restaurant, I think in, in the Washington Square area, I mean, even like uh, North Beach, every Italian restaurant, North Beach, just everywhere I was, <laughs> I ate everything that was like like some of my fondest memories so we couldn't really go out of town very much because i had to be on call um and there was a day i think we were at zuni cafe and i got it you know i was like eating a roast chicken like you do at zuni cafe 
and then got the call to come in in like two hours to do the show. So, you know, sometimes shit happens. But uh, yeah, that's, that's some of my, my fondest memories of my first chunk of time in San Francisco was definitely uh, uh, food. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. I, know, I was wondering if you could um, share a little bit about your, your journey to, to where you are today. I know that we have a lot of younger viewers tuning in. And, and I know that you actually have like an, an interesting um, story about your, your, your journey. You, you made your Broadway debut as Gavroche uh, in Les Mis when you were nine years old. Um, yeah. and, then, and, then, and then you eventually went on to study economics in Princeton. And so what, and then what, was, your, what was that journey like? And then how did you end up back into, into theater and Broadway? Yeah. So, I mean, my parents had me on stage singing before I I knew what that meant. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I can barely remember my first time on stage. I was three, I think. Um, so it felt like the path for me was set before I had a, an opportunity to make that choice. Because what three year old is like, I want to go on, you know, and that doesn't happen. Right. right? So. Mm -hmm suddenly I was singing and that was sort of the thing that I understood as my, as my life, as my, as my reality, as my normal. And then it wasn't until I was 15, uh, 15 years, I, I did a, a sitcom pilot for NBC called the Larsons of Las Vegas. And I have older siblings. So by the time we did this, finally, my older siblings were old enough that uh, my parents were, would, were okay at that point with potentially moving to, to California. Because when I was like seven, I, you know, that I was offered a spot on the Mickey Mouse Club that filmed in Orlando and my parents weren't willing to move down there. So anyway, finally, we were, my, my siblings were out of the house or at college or, or, or out of the house and they were willing to move to, San, to Los Angeles if we needed to. And then this sitcom pilot that was supposed to be the new thing didn't get picked up. Oddly, it was because um, one of the one of the big pieces of feedback was that uh, the father on the show was a professional poker player, mm -hmm. and it was just before the Texas Hold'em craze sort of took over America. And it was certainly before, like you know, you can watch poker on TV. Right. But three years later, poker was on TV just constantly. But at that, that point, it was like not cool that he was a professional poker player. So anyway, show didn't get picked up, and I was heartbroken. And I just having been having already having having had been a professional actor for. 12 years at that point I know as a even as a middle teen I just told my parents I didn't I didn't want to do it anymore I didn't want to make the schlep to New York to audition I didn't want to spend summers in California auditioning I just didn't want to do it mm -hmm. so I was you know thought I would be normal whatever that even means which isn't a thing it's not it's, there is no normal but that's what I thought that I wanted so I uh I went to school, I had a girlfriend, I played lacrosse, and I, you know, I, I studied and I went to Princeton. Now, of course, I got into Princeton by being like, hey, I was on Broadway, we used to <laughs> into Princeton. And then when I got there, I, uh, I, I, I was studying economics, but I also poured all of my time into the Princeton Triangle Club, which is like this really old, incredible musical comedy group that's like student run. F. Scott Fitzgerald was in the, you know, was in the Triangle Club. It's really good. It's like, uh, it's like hasty pudding at, uh, you know, at Harvard. It's that, that kind of a vibe. And I, I was pouring all my time into that and really not, I mean, in the first year I kind of did what I was supposed to do, but I really wasn't enjoying my classes. And I was sort of looking forward, or looking ahead toward a, a future that didn't interest me that felt so disconnected from the person I had been my whole life. So despite the fact that I had quit and wanted to do this, but when I really had it, I had the opportunity to do it. I, I, was, I was deeply unhappy. I became completely depressed. Mm -hmm. um, I had to leave school after two years and move home and, go on Prozac and the whole thing and try to figure out what, what just happened to me and who do I actually want to be? Because uh, I don't think I'd ever asked myself that question. I think I had just always done what I thought I was supposed to do or I thought was the right thing. And mm -hmm. so after a year at home, I moved to New York, a city I had always hated, even when I was on Broadway, you know, I just, it was loud and smelly and, and, you know, obnoxious and scary. And, all of the things that I hated about it as a kid, I really loved <laughs> when I moved there as a, you know, as a 21 year old and um, I moved to a couple of friends for the summer and I was, I was hooked, that was it. So I, I moved back to the city by myself and lived in a studio apartment on the east side for a year and took classes and uh, got back into acting. And, uh, you know, before I knew it, I was, you know, full, full time enrolled in, uh, in the, uh, the Atlantic Theater Company, which is, you know, I spent like two and a half years, like this really intense conservatory and by the time I was done, like there's no musical theater at the Atlantic. I mean, it's not, they're, they're not, it's not that they're not supportive of musical theater, but it is a straight acting school. And by the time I got out, I was like, okay, so I'm going to spend my life. I'm going to do Chekhov, Shakespeare, Ibsen, Shaw, Beckett, like that's it. I'm, I'm not going to do any. And then I, uh, I was playing Hamlet in their downtown theater when I got the call to, uh, to audition for Frankie Valley. And so now I'm, you know, doing these soliloquies at night and 
learning, hey, fuck you, you know, during the day, <laughs> and then suddenly playing Frankie Valli when I really hadn't thought much about singing uh, in, in years. I mean, I, I always sang because it was, you know, the, the thing I grew up doing, but suddenly mm -hmm. I was singing the highest falsetto of my entire <laughs> life and started this six year journey of, of just, you know, killing myself every day to keep my voice in shape. So uh, I don't know what you, what one learns from that, uh, what anyone else learns, because I think everyone's mm -hmm. story is unique and everyone I talk to right. about how they ended up where they are, you know, friends and colleagues, how they get to where they are now is, is their own. Um, I would say that, you know, do the, the life is really hard, even when you're successful. So anyone who's watching, mm -hmm. and if you're, you know, you, you want to be an actor, you know, just be ready for it. And, and now, I don't know what the hell's going on and what theater or film and te television is going to look like now. So, and I don't think does anybody really know. I mean, you know, what is the new normal? So it was hard before. I'm sure it's going to be as hard, if not harder, you know, after this, um, hopefully everything re returns full bore within the next 12 months. But in the meantime, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a, it's a taxing emotional journey. And I would say that, the most important things are to have a really strong bedrock around you, have, you know, a foundation of friends and family, you know, the thing that you can rely on when you're having hard times because the business is, is, is relentless. Mm -hmm. um, and to be prepared for endless rejection. Do not, uh, I think it's, you know, it's critical that you not base your self-worth on what a casting director thinks of you, what a director thinks of you, what a reviewer in some paper and, you know, that you, because half the time those are people you wouldn't even be friends with so ultimately does it matter does it matter what a, what a reviewer in a paper that you don't read and a person that you don't know thinks of you no so like make sure that your self-worth is based on something else um and that you have a life outside of the arts because it can't it can't just be about the, the you know the times the the few times because they will be few that you get the call that changes your life you get to go do the project and they're the, you know those happen and they're wonderful on these incredible high highs but there's, you know, endless lows and endless valleys. There's so many valleys. So you just have to be emotionally prepared for it. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. I don't mean to be a downer about it, but I think it's really important. And I wish someone had said it to me and most, most people do, but just to be really pragmatic about what it means to be, uh, to try to make your living in the arts, you know, and it's, you know, and it's this double-edged sword because the arts are so critical, you know, it's, it's what makes, just what thinks, what's what makes a, a society great is its art. And yet to be an artist can be so, the, the, especially the business side of it, can be so demoralizing at times. So you just have to have your, you know, your emotional armor and uh, have great people around you and support one another and try not to engage in jealousy and, you know, all, all of that. And, and to do it because you really want to. Again, like, I don't know if you take anything from my story. like, I did it as a kid because my parents told me I should. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's, that's good or bad necessarily. I, 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 you know, when I get on stage, I'm not nervous because my parents had me on stage when I was three. That's certainly one of the benefits. Um, but then it certainly felt better as an adult to be like, actually, this is the thing that I want to do. Uh, so I'm going to do it, uh, you know, on my own steam of my own accord and my own volition because I, I choose to. Uh, so I, you know, I definitely, you know, don't, don't let stage parents, you know, push you into something unless you really, really want to do it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing. I think that's, that's some really, really great advice. And I think it ties in like a little, a little nicely with your killer party experience. I can talk about having a, a strong bedrock of foundation around you and support mm -hmm. you. And, and even just yeah, your, your quarantine experience with, with your wife and with Laura Osses and, and her husband and just having that support with you for the first part of quarantine and making yeah. you yourself with, with, with strong like creative energy and just, and, and to be able to, to have that experience and also um, to have the experience and then to share, share it with the, with the world, with people at home. I think that's a really, a really great thing that, that you've done. And, and it was, it's great to see, yeah, great to see. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, I'm, I'm glad that you feel that way. I'm, I'm glad that it brings people joy because God knows we could all use it. So why, right. you know, why, why not uh, do something silly and fun? And I, you know, I, the music is super catchy. I just, you know, buy the album and listen to it, even if you don't want to watch the thing. Yeah. <laughs> the songs are, the songs are great and they're shockingly well recorded. I mean, everything sounds so good. So yeah, but, but yes, to your point, a hundred percent, it was nice to, um, to have that support group and, and, you know, and to make the most of the, of the time. I think that's all you can do is make the most of the time and, you know, and invest in yourself. And we took, my wife and I took a course uh, through Coursera. Uh, they, like there's a Yale program on Coursera and like the science of, science of well-being. I mean, there, there are things that you can do and 
because you're we're suddenly so many of us are given this time and if listen if your job is continued normally god bless but for those of us who haven't it's like you got to find a way to to make the most of this time and uh you know at least that that's that's what some of a killer party did and and i hope that it brings joy to those who uh who are watching it Right. And if you haven't checked yeah. it out, if you're watching, it's at killerpartymusical.com. You can check it out there. All episodes are streaming. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for making the time to talk to us today, Jerry. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And, and you know that San Francisco loves you. And so thank you for, for talking to us. I love uh, San Francisco. It is always my great pleasure. I can't wait to be back. Right. And we can't wait to welcome you back as well. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so. you, you take care and you, you and your wife and everyone. Um, so thank you. Be safe and well. Yeah, you, you too. And everyone, vote. Yes, vote. vote. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. My pleasure.